you can't generalize about recessions. A lot of people, when they think about a recession, they think about 2008, because um, that's really the most recent major one that we've had. I don't think the pandemic one counts. Um, so, you know, when people think of a recession, they think of, um, you know, banks failing and deflation and stuff like that. But all, re all recessions are different. And this one is going to be different, too. Welcome back to Soar Financially. Welcome and thanks so much for joining us. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the at JR Mining Guy on Twitter and the CEO of the Soar Financial Group. We discuss the macro to understand the micro better here on this channel and I've invited a fantastic guest to do so. He's an accomplished book author, podcast host, but also the editor of the Daily Dirt Nap. It's Jared Dillion and we have lots to discuss today because it's a busy, busy week in the markets, especially on the macro side. We're getting a lot of data dumped on us this week and we're trying to make sense ahead of time and to try to you know level expectations a little bit and see where things are headed potentially this week. Christmas is looming as well. We're two weeks away from, uh, or exactly two weeks away from from uh, Christmas Day. Really looking forward to that, of course, as well. But uh, we got the F, uh, the Fed meeting, the FOMC meeting. We got CPI data coming out. We have retail sales and, of course, big bond auction this week as well. So let's let's discuss that. Let's bring our guest on the program. Jared, it's great for you to join us. First time on, on Sora Financially. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is going to be good. Absolutely. Yeah, lots to discuss and uh, really looking forward to this discussion here in the next 30 minutes. But Jared, before we dive into the nitty gritty and some of the details here, let, let's start with a bit of a holistic question. What's the state of the economy? How, how confident are you these days? The state of the economy is that it's slowing slowly, if that makes any sense. <laughs> um, it, and it has been slowing slowly for about a year. Um you know, you've seen the 12 month moving average of non farm payrolls moving lower. You're starting to see claims starting to pick up. The manufacturing surveys have been pretty terrible for a while. Like, you know, everybody knows that this is happening. Um, you know, the yield curve inverted 17 months ago. And prior to that, the longest we had ever gone from a yield curve inversion to a recession was 18 months. And now it looks like it's going to take a little bit longer. Um, but I think that we will get a recession. I think it's going to be mild. And um, yeah, I mean, that's 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 basically the crux of it. Yeah, absolutely. Let's start with the recession topic real quick before we dive into the, the macro data that's being dumped on us here. Why, why is it delayed or why is it taking so long for sort of the lag effect to take hold? Well, I think it's I think it's because, you know, we dumped three trillion into the economy during the pandemic and there's still a lot of that money sloshing around. I've seen a chart floating around on Twitter that talks about the excess savings that people have from the stimulus money and it's gone from a couple trillion down to like four hundred billion. Um, you know, which is reflected in the consumer credit data and stuff like that. So I just think it's, you know, this look like you can't generalize about recessions. A lot of people, when they think about a recession, they think about 2008, because um, that's really the most recent major one that we've had. I don't think the pandemic one counts. Um, so, you know, when people think of a recession, they think of, um, you know, banks failing and deflation and stuff like that. But all, re all recessions are different. And this one is going to be different, too. I think this one's going to be a little bit of a manufacturing recession. Uh, I think you're starting to see defaults pick up, you know, co uh, corporate defaults. Um, but at the same time, the labor market is still super strong. So, you know, it's it's tough to imagine a scenario where unemployment would go above 6%. But I think if it went above 4 or 4.5%, 4 it would get the attention of the people at the Fed. So yeah, those are my thoughts on that. Now, four four and a half percent is that uh, breaking? Like uh, as Jerome Powell put it for you, is that breaking something? Is that already significant in Germany? We're sitting at about five point eight, five point nine, and nobody bats an eye. Yeah, I think um, you know this is an election year in the United States, so I think that the Fed is going to be ultra sensitive to uh, any weakness in the labor market. Of course. You know, the payroll report we got last week, the unemployment rate went down to 3.7. Uh, I'm not really, you know, into the weeds on the economics. I don't know why that happened. But um, yeah, I mean, I think if if you printed 4% on uh, the unemployment rate, 
then that would get people's attention and it would affect the trajectory of the Fed. And, you know, in terms of the Fed, I think that it's not a matter of if they will cut rates. I think it's a matter of when they will cut rates. And I think consensus now is that they will cut in March. And I believe that will happen. Um, and it's not a matter of, it's not a function of weakness in the economy. It's a function of the fact that monetary policy is too restrictive. If you have Fed funds at 5.5% and core PCE at 2.3%, that means you have real rates of 3.2%, which is too restrictive. So I think regardless of what the economy does, the Fed is going to cut probably 100 basis points, which is consistent with what they've been saying in the dot plots for the last couple of months. You, you mentioned a bit of a, a rolling recession. Um, in the man, you, you mentioned the manufacturing sector. Um, I'm going to throw in construction as well. It's not going to be a recession that everybody feels. Like, uh, and uh, I like talking from experience because I'm watching what's happening here in Germany, for example. Just here in the neighborhood, a big developer just went belly up last week. A property developer, right? Building uh, just uh, real, real, real estate for uh, was it private real estate, right? Um, do you see that taking what, what sectors do you see being affected by that uh, sort of rolling recession? It started with trucking and freight in the US, I think. Uh, w w what's next? Well, I think housing could potentially be next. Um, you're seeing a really big divergence. You know, the housing market is starting to roll over uh, somewhat belatedly. You know, one of the things that really got people confused was the fact that interest rates or mortgage rates went to 8%. And the housing market re remained strong for a really long time. Well, now it's starting to roll over. I'm actually trying to sell a house and it's not a musical comedy. Like it's actually been very difficult. So the housing market is rolling over. And meanwhile, the home building stocks are at all time highs, which doesn't make a lot of sense. And I, that's going to resolve itself one way or another. So, um, yeah, you know, I, th I, th yeah, I think that's an anomaly. Absolutely. Um, no, it doesn't make any sense at all. Like, who can afford 8% mortgage rates these days? Like, nobody's really calculated with that. And uh, in, in the US, I think a lot of shorter term, uh, you know, mortgages as well. Like, what's the what's the common average mortgage term in the in the US? Uh, the average more, I mean, the vast majority of people get 30 year fixed, fixed? mortgages, yeah. 30 year fixed, the vast majority. Um, I actually I, uh, I have I'm building a house. So I got a construction loan. I locked in the rate about a year and a half ago. It's a uh, four and a quarter percent on a 10-1 arm. It's uh, so it's adjustable after 10 years. So I'm locked in for four and a quarter for 10 years, which is a pretty good deal. So yeah. so it's it's mostly the new home buyers that are being affected, right? Yeah, so yeah, it's not yeah, yeah. existing. There's no it's like it's not the short term rollovers. Because I know in Canada, for example, it's a bit different. It feels like there's a lot more variable debt or variable mortgages. Um, a lot of shorter term, like two, one to three year mortgage. I've, I've seen that in Vancouver quite often. Yeah, I mean, the the one thing that's unique about the United States housing market is that, you know, I, I think one of the greatest financial innovations of the 20th century was the 30 year fixed rate mortgage, you know the ability for somebody to lock in an interest rate over 30 years and to have the option to prepay um is has really i mean it, it's it's really led to stability in the u.s housing market that other countries don't see i mean most countries have adjustable rates in one way or another and they're sort of at the mercy of the bond market and in the united states we're not even though mortgage rates have gone up significantly the average mortgage rate in the united states right now is about three and a half percent because people locked them in or refinanced when rates were about two and a half percent during the pandemic. Yeah, no, that makes makes a lot of sense. Okay, perfect. Um, I mentioned in my intro we got a lot of data being or coming out this week. Uh, I mentioned Fed, CPI, retail sales, but also bond auctions happening this week. Out of the four, which one is the most important to you this week? Um, definitely the Fed. Um, you're, I mean, we're going to get some clues as that's where you're going to start to get some visibility as to whether they're actually going to cut rates in March. Um, you know, the thing with this, we've had this pattern at the Fed meetings where the directive comes out somewhat dovish and then Powell gets in front of the microphone at the press conference and starts dropping bombs all over the place. Um, this time might be no different. I think, you know, I've been watching the Fed for over 20 years, and 
in an environment where you have some inflation, there's always this boilerplate language that the Fed uses that they have to be vigilant about inflation. And I think people interpret that as a hawkish statement. You know, like Powell, even just last week at that uh, fireside chat, said that the Fed is ready to raise rates, basically, if, you know, if the data starts to get hot. And they're really not. They're not. They're done raising rates. You know, they, they've, you know, several Fed governors have specifically said they're done raising rates. So that's not, you know, that's boilerplate language and people get all excited about it and it doesn't mean anything. Yeah, I think he's trying to keep the market in check as well. Because if he says we're going to start cutting rates, the market is going to go ballistic. Yep. Absolutely, yep. right. I'm um, just looking at the the Fed uh, Fed watch tool here as well. One point six chance, one point six percent chance of uh, of a rate hike. Is that uh, you know the uh, what's, it, what's a good good word for it? The the people that believe him <laughs> that uh, do believe that. <laughs> Uh, credulity. Um, one point six percent chance of a rate hike at this meeting. I think that it. I think that chance is zero. Uh, I was going to say, I like, would. what are the Vegas odds for that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So really, really interesting. But um, you you mentioned March a couple times, and I need to follow up on that, like, because there's one more meeting, or actually, we have this meeting this week, then we have one in January, and then yep. uh, March twentieth. Why do you say March? Why not January or uh, even uh, May, for example? Well, you know, I think that. If we had had a weak payroll report last week, I think a March cu I think a March cut would have been more likely. If we had a, a weak payroll report in December, January, and February, then it would have been pretty much a sure thing that we would have cut rates in March. Um, but the payroll report was not weak. It wasn't really strong, but it was above expectations. And I think that reduces the probability for a March rate cut. Um, but I, I think it's, it's still, it still depends on the data, you know? No, absolutely. Okay. In, in, interesting. Cause I'm just following through here as well. Cause a lot of people predict like oh, you mentioned as well, like a 1% or hundred basis point cuts cut next year. And I'm just counting the meetings. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven meetings next year. Um, so they might have to cut it uh, at least four of the meetings. I'm really curious how that's going to play out. Um, C CPI, of course, is a is a big factor that goes into like the Fed decision making here as well. We get some CPI data this week here as well. Um, did we beat inflation, Jared? Did we beat it, like Paul Krugman said? Um, so in the short term, yes. In the long term, no. Um, and we we were successful in bringing inflation down, but we did not break the inflationary psychology. Okay, inflation is a monetary phenomenon, like Milton Friedman said, but it's also a psychological phenomenon. If people believe that there is inflation, they will take actions to perpetuate inflation, okay? They will buy faster, they will buy more, they will, they will act in such a way that causes prices to go up. And that's why inflation expectations are so important. And I think on Friday, we got some, uh, the University of Michigan survey, we got some information on inflation expectations. And inflation expectations are coming down quite a bit. And the Fed pays attention to this. Um, but even still, like, you know, there is a risk here. If the Fed cuts 100 basis points, 200 basis points, and inflation goes back up, we're going to have to go through this all over again. And we're going to end up with, you know, 10 year rates of seven, eight, nine percent, And it's going to be a nightmare. Um, and I don't think in order to break the inflationary psychology, you need to engineer a recession that is severe enough that people stop expecting price increases. And that's really the beauty of what Volcker did in 1980 is that he he raised interest rates so much. You know, that recession in the early 80s was negative 6% GDP. It was a very, very severe recession. And that broke the inflationary psychology. So we didn't do that this time. Um, and we still, I mean, just talk to an average person. You know, people believe that there is inflation. Even though inflation has come down from 9% to 3%, people still have this psychology ingrained in their head. Absolutely. I was in the US last week as well and uh, bought a cup of Starbucks coffee, grande, not the venti, grande, just black coffee and a couple egg bites. I paid $15 for it at the hotel. 
So tell me, <laughs> tell me we've beaten inflation. Please tell me. Like, and you, you take the 20% uh, hotel fee on top of that, like take that off. Like it's still 13, 12, 50, $13 for a cup of coffee, black coffee and a couple egg bites, like two eggs, pretty much microwaved. Unbelievable. <laughs> Try finding a breakfast place like that charges less than $15 a plate these days. Yeah. Yeah. So it's uh, just for a couple of eggs, some hash browns, maybe a couple strips of bacon. It's uh, I have a hard time finding that. Like it's it's interesting. So we talk about inflation. I look at that, and I was like, no, that doesn't make any sense. Especially you know, now. I think people. You know, this is what I hear all the time. You know, I live in South Carolina. This is not a financial hub by any means. You know, we just have very average people here, like real estate appraisers and people who work in service industries and stuff like that, and. You know, they they talk about going to the grocery store and they're like, look, like I have like half a cart full of stuff. Like I can still see the bottom of the cart. I have like half a cart full of stuff and it's 230 bucks, you know, and people have a memory of what it was like before the pandemic when it was 110 bucks. And, you know, they think they say we still have inflation, even though the rate of inflation has come down quite a bit. I don't know. Another example is chapstick. $4.50 for a bird's bee. No, it doesn't. <laughs> it, it's insane. I'm not sure what is going on. Like, like, that blew my mind last week. Like, it's brutal. Like, it is a nice reality check, right? Um, talking about that, retail sales, I think, is a big one that's coming out this week as well. And uh, looking at my consumer behavior, I'm slowing down spending. If I see chapstick for four fifty. Yeah, I mean, I don't really have a prediction on retail sales. I mean, if I were to predict, I'd say they'd be kind of flat and not super exciting. Um, you know, the Black Friday sales were basically flat to last year when you take inflation into account. Um, I think I think holiday shopping is pretty flat. Um, you know, so people people are slowing down consumption because of inflation, but not a lot. You know, so I think out of the out of the all the numbers we're getting this week, I think retail sales is probably the least important. Um, for sure, it's the Fed and CPI. Yeah, gotcha. Um, bond auctions. I know you're following the bond market quite closely as well. We we have to talk about that. Is that a big uh, a black swan event looming, or is that uh, business as usual this week? Uh, do you know what maturities are being offered? Uh, I think part of it is thirty years. Thirty. Some... It's going to be a thirty year bond auction. Yeah. Um. Well, you know, I can tell you that um, one of the risks to bond auctions this week is that rates have done, come down quite a bit. You know, so if you look at a 30-year bond at 4.3% versus 5%, it's a lot less attractive. Um, and I don't know the I don't know the size of the auctions. I haven't I haven't really paid like super close attention to bond auctions since 2009, but um, you know, since rates have come down a lot, I'm, I'm guessing these auctions are going to be less attractive. I mean, I don't really see a scenario where we have a failed auction or a super weak auction or anything like that. But if you start seeing auctions with a bid to cover below two and they're kind of sloppy auctions and they tail by like five or six basis points, I mean, that is a possibility, you know, but... Yeah, no, no, fair enough. Like, I'm not a big expert on it as well, but just uh, something we've been discussing here on the channel a bit as well, just bonds and the bond market, because I think it's 110 tr uh, billion they're trying to issue this week. So it's not yeah. a small amount, right? So that's why I'm, I'm keeping an eye on it just as that Black Swan event, just for something. I don't know, we're, like I mentioned to you in the intro, we're always so gloomy or like doomy here. Um, we're always looking for something <laughs> to break the system and, you know, cause a crash or something. We should be looking out for something gloomy. Like, Jared, since I have you, like, what is something gloomy you're looking at these days? Like, where are you putting your money to work? Uh, what is something gloomy I'm looking at? Well, I think that uh, stocks are going to peak very, very soon, uh, probably next week. Um, I'm going to be looking to put on a short of some kind. Um, you know, sentiment has gotten very extended on the bullish side. Like if you look at the surveys, like, you know, the bulls have gone up, the bears have gone down. Um, starting to see some victory laps on Twitter by the index fund guys. Um, you know, you're starting to see distribution. You know, if you look at the price action intraday, We've had several days where the market opens on the highs and closes on the lows, you know, which is a sign of distribution. So, yeah, I think, you know, looking at the charts, I think we're going to peak sometime next week. Um, and then then it potentially could get a lot ugly. 
No. So one last Christmas rally here, and then a uh, bit of a reset for the new year. Is that really yep, just people yep. chasing uh, performance and having saying, hey, we own the mag uh, magnific uh, Magnificent 7 uh, in our portfolio? Is that just part of it? Well, I don't think anybody owns those stocks because they want to own them. I think they own them because they have to own them. Because if you don't own them, then you're going to underperform. And it's it's led to this sort of herd mentality. Um, you know, and it just if, you know, I've talked about this in my newsletter, like, even if I thought that Apple was the best stock in the world, it was going to a five trillion market cap. I wouldn't recommend it in my newsletter because you can do that on your own. You really don't need help doing that. And it's just going to make your portfolio more pro-cyclical. Uh, the highs are going to be higher. The lows are going to be lower. And you're going to experience more volatility. You know, I try to look for uncorrelated stuff. That's what I do for a living. So, For example? <laughs> like Argentina. Like okay. Argentina has been a big theme uh, in my newsletter for going back about eight months, you know, we, I've, that, that was one geopolitical situation that I studied very closely. I said early on, very early on before Malay was even picked up by the press, I said, this guy had a chance of winning. So that's been, you know, that's been a, you know, not to pound my chest, but that's been a great uncorrelated trade for the newsletter. So how, how did you trade it? If I may ask you, did you buy Argentine pesos or FX? Like uh, what, how'd you play that trade? Just curious. No, I bought I bought stocks. Okay. Uh, I, I bought I still own them. Uh, YPF and GGAL, so an oil company in the bank. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, because Argentina is one of the I wouldn't call them a black swan, but an interesting event that happened this year because they want to pack the currency to the dollar, get rid of the peso, and uh, reintroduce the dollar, uh, opening their markets a bit. And uh, of course, the the new president is a bit of a libertarian, so he's already close down sub departments and ministries and uh, he wants to change things up so we're really curious what that what that does on a global scale as well um Jared like what you, you host a podcast as well and one of the theory or one of the the titles is uh, finance is full of conspiracy theories right so i got to ask you like what what is the biggest one or one is one of the conspiracy theories that you've uncovered here uh there's two big ones um one of them is the plunge protection team right the ppt which Everybody was talking about in 2017, like the mid 2010s, um, you know, people noticed that the market would rip from three o'clock to four o'clock into the close. And they said, this can't be real. You know, there is a president's working group on financial markets, and there's a lot of bank CEOs and hedge fund leaders that are part of that group. And that's kind of the genesis, of the plunge protection theme, conspiracy theory. But people actually believe that there's a guy at the New York Fed sitting in an office buying S&P E-minis, like ripping them into the clothes, and that the Fed owns like billions of dollars, trillions of dollars worth of stock. And I'm like, you know, like if that were true, then somebody would have to roll those futures and <laughs> the roll would be like completely distorted. Like you would, you would definitely, and it would show up in the commitment to traders. Like you can't, you can't conceal that type of activity. So um, you don't, you don't hear people talking about, you know, we had a bear market, so nobody talks about the plunge protection team anymore. <laughs> no, so. Exactly. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Um, conspiracy theories is a good segue to gold as well because <laughs> uh, the gold space is full of them as well but uh, we have to talk about the yellow metal and uh, the precious metal here uh recently marked all-time high uh jared like what do you what do you make of that like because we couldn't hold it and we're below two thousand dollars again today um what, what does the gold price tell you these days um you know i i hold gold but i don't trade it i haven't traded it ever um, I think if I traded gold, I would probably be broke. Um, it doesn't make any sense to me. Like it's really, really hard to trade. And every time I have an opinion on gold, it turns out to be wrong. Um, you know, last, not last Sunday, but the Sunday before when gold, you know, ran some stops in Asia and put in that high around 2135, like, you know, I was counting my money and, uh, I said, you know, this is great. Um, but you know, gold trades very technically in that it was an ugly candle and they called it a hanging man. And now people are pressing on the short side. Like, you know, I just try to tune out all this stuff and think about it in terms of decades, right? And when I started to buy gold in 2005, 
really the thesis was that gold would outperform stocks over a lifetime, right? Not over one year, three year, five years, like really over a lifetime of investing. And not to get into too much detail, but I was seeing some things politically that led me to believe that. And I still believe that. So, yeah, I mean, I have a large position and um, right now it's uh, putting in new lows. It's trading around 1983 and it's, you know, it's it, it's super frustrating. So tell me about it. <laughs> I'm on the mining side here as well. And I'm just looking at all the like the little gains that we made last week are just disappearing. Right, or just yep. evaporating because it's all back to like as you said, doom and gloom. Like yeah, nobody believed believed in uh, you know the break above uh, the all time high level there. Uh, absolutely, ah, de devastating. To be honest, it's demoralizing to a degree. Um, Jared, you have a new book coming out uh, uh, in January uh, called No Worries, and it kind of fits because it's uh, you know beginning of the new year, and uh, you're you're talking about uh, you know financial freedom and uh, you sort of liberating yourself in the, from the markets a bit. How does that fit in with a forecast for 2024 as well? And uh, how, how timely is that advice? Well, uh, the subtitle of the book is uh, How to Live a Stress-Free Financial Life. And this is a, it's not really an investing book. It's really more of a personal finance book. And I talk about how the two biggest activators of financial stress are debt and risk, Okay. So if you have a lot of debt, you're going to have a lot of stress. If you have a lot of risk, you're going to have a lot of stress. And if you don't have debt and risk, you don't have stress. It doesn't matter how much money you have. Like you could be broke living paycheck to paycheck. And if you don't have debt and you don't have risk, you're a happy person. Like you're totally stress-free. Then on the other hand, you can have a guy like Elon Musk, the richest guy in the world, who leveraged up to buy Twitter and then Tesla went down 75% and he almost got a margin call. And, you know, the richest guy in the world almost went tits up, you know? So um, like it, like, and that was self-inflicted. And a lot of people like when they, when they structure their financial affairs, they structure them in such a way that actually increases their financial stress. And I, I try really hard not to do that. You know, it's funny you mentioned gold, like is as volatile as gold is. It's really not any more volatile than stocks. And in the, and really for the last couple of months, except for the last couple of weeks, it was less volatile than stocks, you know? So, um, a lot of people put gold into that bucket of risky investments, but it's really, it's really not, you know? Um, it's kind of slow and boring. So, <laughs> absolutely, yeah. It's it's an insurance policy. That's what that is. Like, it's, yeah, all right. Depends on how you buy it. Of course, if you buy paper gold, that's more of a trade. But if you buy physical, that's more of an investment, and you can put aside and have, don't have to worry about it. Right. Um, yeah. Lift the skirt on the book a little bit. Like, what are some of the key chapters? What uh, what what are you most proud of, or like, what is one of the key takeaways that uh, you want the reader to take away from it? Well, one of the key takeaways, you know, the there is a personal finance industry in the United States. Um, you have Dave Ramsey and Susie Orman, and then you have, on top of that, you have thousands of personal finance bloggers, you know, and YouTubers and all that stuff. They all say the same thing. They all say the same thing. If you don't buy coffee at Starbucks, then you will have enough money for retirement. Right Back to Starbucks like if you, again. If I would have saved those fifteen dollars, <laughs> if, if you stop buying interest. coffee at Starbucks, you will have enough for retirement. So you know it's funny. Like I drive into work every day and I get a coffee from Dunkin' Donuts, and it's three dollars and seventy cents. And I work two hundred and fifty days a year, so that's nine hundred bucks a year. And if I didn't drink coffee for forty years, that's thirty six thousand dollars. And if I put it in an index fund, I would maybe make one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So. If I stopped buying coffee at Dunkin' Donuts, I would have $150,000 at retirement. So that is true. That is true. But people cannot give up small luxuries. Any program which asks you to give up a small luxury like coffee is not going to work because you can't sustain that over a long period of time. As it turns out, if you do the math, the little stuff like the coffee and generic brand soup and all that stuff it doesn't matter. What matters is what kind of house do you buy, right? 
if you get a 2,400 square foot house instead of a 2,800 square foot house and you pay $100,000 less, you will save $120,000 in interest over the life of the loan, which is like an in, like three lifetimes of coffee. So the little stuff just does not matter. In the United States, we are taught that it's the little things that matter, right? Whether you make your bed in the morning, turning off the lights when you leave a room, so it, that stuff does not matter at all. It doesn't matter at all. It's the big stuff. It's your house, it's the car, and it's student loans. And that is it. That's all that matters, not any of this other stuff. Fantastic. Interesting. And uh, the book is already available for pre-order. So since it's uh, Christmas and holidays here, we'll put a link below, hey? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. You can already order it on Amazon coming out January 23rd. Um, yep. next year. Um, talking about next year, Jared, let's uh, sort of put a summary around the conversation here and provide a bit of a forecast. Like, wh what do you expect to happen in 2024? You, you hinted at the rate cuts, but uh, overall, like the economy, markets, um, I've seen a lot of predictions from uh, other analysts like on Bloomberg and Reuters, like, hey, we're going to have a great rally into the new year, and then uh, things are going to tank come uh, maybe second half of the year. Do you have a similar prediction? I, I do have a similar prediction. I think I think that's about right. But I, one thing I will point out is that there is some seasonality around the election, and stocks tend to do well in the fourth year of a president's term, you know, for obvious reasons. Uh, I don't think that's going to be the case this time. I think stocks are going to struggle next year, um, and I think rates are going to be lower. I think ten-year rates are going to go down to about three and a half. I think two-year rates are going to go down to about two and a half. Um, I'd like to make a prediction on gold, but I have no idea what's going to happen there. Um, so yeah. No, fantastic. Awesome. No, Jared, really, really appreciate your time. I know you're extremely busy. I see your podcasts and interviews and your book tours everywhere. So I uh, really appreciate you making the effort and, uh, coming, coming on, uh, where, where can we find more of you? I know we're going to link to the book below, but, uh, on a more regular basis. Uh, so yeah, definitely go to the book, buynoworries.com, pre-order a copy. And if you want to check out the newsletter, it's www.dailydirtnap.com. Yes. Quick question, Jared, while I have you, what does daily, uh, daily dirt nap mean? Dirt nap? Maybe it's a so, language thing. I so I started my career on the, uh, Pacific coast options exchange and it was kind of a, there was a lot of surfers on the floor, you know, they would be done working at one and they would go surfing. So the, the, they, that the floor kind of had its own lexicon and dirt nap was a term for the market going down. So you would see the surfer guy staring at the screen and they'd be like, dude, the spoos are taking a hell of dirt nap. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I thought it was a language thing because I'm German. I'd never heard that word. So, because I know what dirt and nap is, but put together, no clue. So, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> awesome. No, I appreciate that, Jared. Again, thanks so much for your time. Thank you so much for coming on, and, uh, everybody else. Thank you so much for joining us here on Soar Financially. If you enjoyed this conversation, make sure to hit that subscribe button, hit that like button as well. That way, we can invite guests like Jared more regularly on the program. And of course, go check out his book. We're going to link it to it down below here on Amazon. And, uh, Tell your friends, thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll be back with lots, lots more. Thank you so much.